turn to Matthew chapter 6. We'll just be reading that in a moment. Uh, perhaps if you're watching this as part of your Lord's Day worship, you've already sung a few hymns. I trust that you've prayed and asked for the Lord's help to open your heart to his word. Uh, but as we begin, I'm going to pray and ask for the Lord's help as well. Father in heaven, please help us to receive your word. We thank you for it. We acknowledge our dependence on your Holy Spirit to open our eyes and help us to see the truth that you want us to see. We pray for your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to begin by reading from Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 9, this part of the scripture that, we're, uh, that we call the Lord's Prayer. Verse 9 of Matthew 6. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This is God's word. J.C. Ryle said about this portion of Scripture uh, that no part of Scripture is so full and so simple at the same time as this. And I think that is really true of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, in fact, uh, as I preach on this in this video, I'm only going to be addressing the first two words, the words, Our Father. Uh, but just before we come to that, I just want to make a few comments about the Lord's Prayer in general. Uh, while it is certainly a good practice to recite this as a prayer, uh, we must understand that uh, that was perhaps not the primary intent of the Lord in giving this prayer to us. It's really intended as a pattern. Or you could think of it as a skeleton, which is only truly helpful if we are able to fill it in with, with relevant scriptural truth. So each of these requests really uh, forces us to ask the question, what does it mean to pray along these lines? All right, so the primary lesson of the Lord's Prayer is not that we must pray these exact words, although as we come to understand what Jesus is talking about in these prayer requests of the Lord's Prayer, praying the words of the Lord's Prayer becomes an even more profitable exercise. So when Jesus warned against hypoc hypocritical praying in verses 5 through 8, we, we looked at that last week, he spoke against engaging in prayer as performance, and also he spoke against approaching prayer as some kind of a mechanistic process where you just say the right words so you can get God to do what you want. And in teaching against these errors, Jesus showed us the foolishness of praying that way because of the kind of father our God is. He is a father who sees in secret, so we ought not to make a show of praying before others. And he is the father who knows what we need before we ask. So we ought not to think that multiplying words and phrases in prayer is what will help us to get what we ask. So as he addressed those wrong ways of praying, we saw last week that he spoke a couple different times of the fact that God was our Father. And so then when he teaches them how to pray, in verse 9 it says, pray then like this. And no, he, he doesn't say pray this pray these words. He says, pray like this, okay? Pray along the lines of the things that I'm going to tell you. But he begins with the words, our Father. Christ taught us that when we pray, we should address God as our Father. So that is the title of this sermon, Pray to God Our Father. And this sermon just has two points. Uh, and it basically has to do with two things that we are reminded of when we pray to God as our Father. All right, so when we pray to God as our Father, first of all, we are reminded that we pray in fellowship 
with other believers. And I'm focusing there on the word our. Now, I'm not going to make a, a huge point of this, but it is significant that Jesus, in this prayer, uses plural pronouns. All right, note that in this invocation or this introduction of the prayer and in the later requests, Jesus speaks in the plural. He says, our Father, not my Father. He says, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. All right, when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, it's interesting that he used this plural reference. And I think that reminds us that we, when we pray as Christians, we pray in fellowship with other believers. It perhaps is a helpful reminder that sometimes it's useful as a church to recite the Lord's Prayer together. It's, it's worded uh, so that it, it's very suitable for that. But when we pray this, uh, we have in mind that, that we are part of a work of God that is bigger than just ourselves. When I pray the Lord's Prayer, when I consider how Christ taught us to pray, I'm, I'm immediately reminded that He's our Father, not just my Father. Not that I should only pray for others, or that I must always pray in the plural, saying our and we, but we ought to think of this in terms of what we learned in 1 John, as our church looked at 1 John uh, back in the month of uh, February. That one mark of a Christian is that he or she loves other Christians. So 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. So even when we pray, there is somewhere in our hearts an awareness of our family connection with other believers. And family concerns are, are never far from our minds. And perhaps especially in this time when we are isolated from one another, we need to remember this. It might even be helpful for you when you pray that sometimes, even in private prayer, you address God as our Father to remind yourself that, that you are not alone. It's not just you and God, even though physically at that time you might be by yourself, but you are part of a body. You're part of a family of believers. I think one thing, uh, just to relate this to the, the current situation, uh, one thing that churches are learning as we are not able to meet in fact, we're not even able to go to one another's houses or, or speak to one another. Uh, there have been a few occasions when I've seen one or another person in our church, but generally speaking, we're, we're not seeing each other. Uh, my hope is that what we'll learn through this is that it is a precious privilege to be part of a local church and that when we do come back together, uh, we will have a heightened sense of the fact that this, this matters. This is important. We are part of something that goes beyond just our own individual concerns. Praying our Father teaches us that. So first of all, praying to God as our Father reminds us that we pray in fellowship with other believers. But secondly, and this is the, 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 the major point uh, as we look at this, uh, when we pray to God as our Father, we are reminded that we pray to a God who loves us. And I want to consider this from a, a few different perspectives this morning. Uh, first of all, uh, as we pray to God as our Father, we, we understand that we are calling God, that when we call God our Father, we are being reminded of our salvation. Right? Calling God our Father reminds us of our salvation. Because how did God come to be your Father in the first place? Now, sometimes, just generally speaking, people will say things like, well, we're all God's children. Uh, and, 
in a very general sense, that is true. God is the father of everyone in the sense that he is their maker. He's their creator. But what the Bible normally means when it speaks of God being someone's father is that that person has become a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ. So, yes, in a general sense, everyone, Christian and non-Christian, is a child of God. But really, in the biblical sense, only people who have come to faith in Jesus Christ can really be called children of God. And the scripture is clear about this. I'll just give you a number of scripture passages here. First of all, in John 1, speaking of Jesus coming to earth, it says he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. All right, it's to those who receive him, to those who believe in his name. Those are the ones who have the right to become the children of God. And then in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, it just says very simply, In Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. And then again in Galatians 4, in beginning in verse 4, it says, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, okay, speaking of the time when Jesus came and was born as a baby, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. So how is it that God came to be your father? Well, it's because of Jesus Christ, because you came to put your faith in Jesus Christ, that's how you became a child of God. That's how God became your father in, in the truly meaningful sense that the Bible speaks of. And, and secondly, then, you know, as we think of this fact that to call God our father in prayer reminds us of our salvation, uh, we have to see that this came about through the mercy and love of God. You, you can call God your Father because of His grace. And again, let me just point you to a number of scriptures. For example, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. If you are a Christian, your faith is in Jesus Christ, you can call God your Father not because you've earned that right. You never, you left to yourself, you never would have desired that or sought that. That came about because of God's great love and grace towards you. Ephesians 1 speaks more specifically of that. Beginning in verse 4, at the end, very end of verse 4, it says, In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. How was it that you were adopted, that you became a child of God? It was because God chose you for that. He set his love on you. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. You became a child of God, not because you set out to do that, but because God set his love on you and brought you to himself. And so you just relate this back to prayer. When we pray our Father and call God our Father in prayer, we are speaking of something that is that was an impossibility apart from the great grace of God. And so then it is God's will that the Christian knows in the depths of his soul that he or she is a child of God. You think of this, Galatians chapter 4, we, we looked at this passage already, verses 6 and 7. All right, verse 5 of Galatians 4 said that Christ came to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. But then it goes on, and because you are sons... God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, 
Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. So having become a child of God, the Spirit of God's Son, Jesus Christ, has been sent into your hearts crying, Abba, Father. Now, Abba was a term that children in biblical times used to address their fathers. It was a, a term of, of relational intimacy. And the Spirit of God's Son is in your heart crying, Abba, Father. God wants you to know you are his child and to act that way, to think that way, to cry out to God in that way. Uh, Romans 8, verses 15 to 16, speak of the same truth. It says there, You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So one of the roles that the Holy Spirit plays uh, as he indwells us, is to confirm, to, to bear witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So to be able to, in truth, call God your Father. And when we come to him in prayer, we say, Our Father, we are speaking of God's infinite, deep love for us, his great grace for us, and this supernatural reality that takes place in the soul of every Christian, that the Spirit of God bears witness with your spirit that you are God's child. And calling God our Father in prayer is just shorthand for that. The more you understand of that, the more meaningful it is to you to speak to Him as your Father. So calling God our Father reminds us of our salvation and calling God our Father also reminds us of the relationship we have with Him. God the Father said of Jesus, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. You just think of what was being communicated when God said that about His own Son at Jesus' baptism. He is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Wouldn't you want God to talk that way about you? This is my child, my son, my daughter, and I am just, I am well pleased with them. Well, we do not have the exact same relationship with the Father that Jesus has. Because while Jesus has in common with us a human nature, he also has a divine nature which we do not have. But because we have been counted righteous through faith in Jesus Christ, we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ, and we are entitled to enter the presence of God as much as Jesus is. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Scripture says we are accepted in the beloved. So what God said about Jesus, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. He does say that about you. He does view you that way. You might feel as if when you go to pray that, that God is just automatically displeased with you. That you are, you are really pushing the envelope to seek God in prayer because you know you're not worthy. And yet, Jesus says, call God your Father. Come to Him and say, our Father. And that reminds us of the relationship we have with Him. And it's not a strained relationship. It's not a relationship that is in danger of being broken up. You, you, re, your relationship to God as your Father is based on your position in Jesus Christ. And this is how Jesus prayed. He spoke to God as my Father. You might remember from last week in John 11, Jesus in prayer said to his Father, I know that you always hear me. And we can say the same thing. Father, I know you hear me. 
It's especially striking to note the prayers of Jesus from the cross, where Jesus over and over again calls out to his Father in his darkest hour. He, he knew God would hear him. God was his Father. So how do you think of God when you come to him in prayer? You know, the book of Esther tells of how Esther needed to enter the king's presence, this Old Testament story uh, she needed to enter the king's presence, but the problem was that one could only enter into his, his inner court if they had been called. And if they came without being called, the only way that you would be accepted in his presence is if he, he raised his, his golden scepter to you. And if he didn't do that, you would be killed. And so, of course, Esther was fearful about going to the king, even though he was her husband, uh, he hadn't called her, uh, and, but she did go, and he did put out a scepter, and she was accepted. But sometimes I think Christians approach prayer with that, that same kind of doubt and dread. Doubt over whether God will want to hear from them, and, and dread over whether they will be accepted when they come. Now, as we're going to see there is a sense where it is, you know, very appropriate that we come uh, reverently. I'm not going to address that much in this sermon, but, uh, you know, he, Jesus says, say, our Father in heaven. And, and I'll say more about that in the future. So it's not that we come casually, but, but it is not a mark of piety, I don't think, to, to come cringing before God, acting as if uh, you don't belong there. Uh, not when he's your father. So calling God our father uh, uh, reminds us of our salvation. It reminds us of the relationship that we have with him. And, and then thirdly, calling God our father reminds us of the care he has for us. Because we live in a sinful world, uh, the word father does not bring to mind an image of love and care for everyone. You know, some earthly fathers can be harsh, abusive, cruel, and neglectful. Uh, for some, that there's no one in the world who has done them more harm than their own father. Uh, and, and so because of that, there are times when people struggle to grasp this concept, even as Christians, because... Uh, their, their image of father in their mind is someone who's, who's just not trustworthy, someone who they've had to get away from, someone who's hurt them. And even good earthly fathers make mistakes despite their best intentions. Uh, even good earthly fathers are still sinners and, and will sin even against their children. But, but God is the very best of fathers. He's the very best of fathers. 2 Corinthians 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. This is who our Heavenly Father is, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Uh, Psalm 103 says, As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who who fear him, for he knows our frame, and he remembers that we are dust. So when we come to God as our Father, and we, we call him our Father in prayer, we're being reminded of the fact that he cares for us. He's a God of compassion. And, and Jesus, later in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 7, says, If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So we come to God as our Father, confident that he will give us good things. You know, Consider what kind of a father God is. He's a father of infinite wisdom. He always knows what is best. He's a father of endless compassion. He is kind to the undeserving. He's a father of limitless power. Nothing is impossible for him. He's a father of enduring faithfulness. He, in fact, he's more committed to your well-being than you are, and he will not give up on you. 
Calling God our Father also honors him as the one to whom we submit and on whom we depend. Uh, we'll come to this more when we consider that he is our Father in heaven. But uh, you consider you know, the modern notion, which is uh, in many ways just completely wrong, is that um, you know, fathers should view their children as their peers. Fathers don't occupy any special position of authority over the children. Uh, the children have uh, as much right as the father has. And in one sense they do, but in a, in a household, in a family, uh, the father, by God's appointment, is the head of that family. And by God's appointment, that father has authority over those children, which he is to use for their good their protection and their care. When we call God our Father, we are acknowledging that he is in a position of authority over us. And we honor him as we call him our Father. So we should not come in a spirit of casual presumption, but we may come with hopeful expectancy. It is right to think that we have God's undivided attention when we pray. All right, you think of the kindest, gentlest, most loving father imaginable. And when his children come to him with their requests, they have his undivided attention. Now, earthly fathers often are incapable of that. Earthly fathers struggle sometimes to give their undivided attention to their children. But your heavenly father, he doesn't have that limitation. It is right to think that we have God's undivided attention when we pray. And it is also right to think that we have complete access to him when we pray. So prayer to God is not like the conversation you may have had with a neighbor recently. Well, we're all meant to keep at least two meters apart. We're not really meant to be socializing. And so you, you might chat with them from across the street or, or through an open window. And you have no time or opportunity for, for any uh, very intimate or familiar conversation. God has as much time as you will give him. You do not have to get God's attention when you pray. That is the pagan notion that Jesus addressed earlier in verses 7 and 8 about the the Gentiles or the pagans who think that they're going to be heard for their many words. You've got to somehow get God's attention. God is the kind of father who is always able and ready and willing to pay attention to the prayers of his children. He has as much time as you will give him. Our shortcomings in prayer really have nothing to do with what we've been given as God's children. Nothing to do with our circumstances. They have everything to do with our own doubts and willingness to neglect prayer in favor of other concerns. And it is true, I've said before, you know, prayer is hard work uh, precisely because we are fallen people. We're sinners. Uh, to devote our attention to prayer, to maintain our, our mental focus in prayer, uh, to completely give ourselves to the activity of prayer is, is, is not easy at times. Most of the time, it's not easy. But when we come to God as our Father, we, we can at least begin with this, that He is ready to hear us. He is more willing to hear than we are to pray. He is more willing to help us than we are willing to ask for it. He is more able to focus on our prayers and listen to us and hear us than we are able to focus on praying to him. So when we pray to God as our Father, we are reminding ourselves of the reality that we could not have a better position from which to pray. Who would be more likely to hear your prayers than your own Father who set his love on you long before you ever loved him or even knew him? Who better to seek in prayer than the God who sought you and gave his own Son for you so that you could call him Father? Father. 
You see, when Jesus uh, began this prayer that he taught his disciples, our Father in heaven, this wasn't just uh, one, one way of addressing God out of uh, many equally useful ways of addressing God. Uh, it was normal among the Jews of that day to use highly exalted titles for God. And God has many highly exalted titles that we, we use in our hymns and we might use in, in worshiping God in prayer as well. But what Jesus emphasized was that when we approach God, we approach him as our Father. He is highly exalted. He is our Father in heaven. But he is the one with whom we have a relationship, the one who saves us, the one who cares for us, the one whose attention we may have when we decide to seek him in prayer. And I think this will help us. It will help you as you pray that your starting point is not yourself. And this is very often our problem that we are focused on ourselves when we pray. When we go to God, uh, we are thinking about ourselves. We're thinking about our performance. We're thinking about the fact that we are not as good as we ought to be. We're perhaps thinking about how, uh, even though we're praying now, we haven't been praying as much as we should, or it's been a long time since we've really prayed uh, very, with any sort of focus or, or devotion. Uh, we may be just thinking of uh, the fact that um, there are other people more important than us or other people who pray better than us. Uh, we could be focused on the fact that, uh, as, we, as I mentioned last time, we, our prayers might not be very eloquent. But when we come to God in prayer, we come thinking of him and addressing him as our Father, which speaks of his great grace towards us. We pray, we are reminded that we pray to a God who loves us. And is ready to hear us. Well, if you intend to sing any more hymns uh, by yourself on this Lord's Day, I would want to encourage you to sing what is uh, number 419 in our hymn book from church. Uh, our Heavenly Father calls and Christ invites us near. With both our friendship shall be sweet and our communion dear. I'll try to put a link to that hymn in the description of this video. And if there's a video that plays that hymn, perhaps you can listen to it online and, and sing along. We pray to God as our Father. Let me encourage you to take time, even right now, to just go to God in prayer, remembering that He is your Father who saves you, your Father who loves you, who cares for you, who has brought you into relationship with himself. That should be a, a motivation to pray. Let nothing hold you back. May God help you in your prayer life. Amen.